I have hanging on the wall right next to my desk a black and white drawing of a picture that you no doubt have seen many times of the lemmings that flock off the cliffs into the ocean below drowning themselves and it shows the picture of a bluff and it's just covered with lemmings and at the very top of the picture is one of these little bubbles for a text message and inside the bubble is the message excuse me excuse me one lone lemming trying to fight the crowd and move to safety I think that gives kind of a a picture of a lot of the attitude of professing believers regarding holiness and sanctification the hordes don't have any interest in it at all have no interest I'm free in Christ I can live as I please all I need to do is just confess my sin and ask God to forgive me and he'll forgive me and it's all wiped off the slate and I can do as I please doesn't matter there are others who say once saved always safe don't have to worry about it was born again as a child I remember when I made a decision for the Lord I'm safe forever doesn't matter it's the very few who have the excuse me attitude who fight the crowd who pursue after God who seek after him and desire to live holy and righteous lives on the night that Christ was betrayed he gave a message only John records it it's about three chapters long starts in chapter 14 of John runs through John 17 in that message he covers a variety of subjects closes it with his prayer John 17 in John 17 in his prayer he covers eight things just in that prayer one of the eight things that he covers in that prayer is sanctification and holiness he prays starting in verse number 17 if you have scriptures and you want to look it up it's John 17 starting in verse number 17 and we'll use it as at least our text today and this is how he prays sanctify them in the truth your word is truth as you sent me into the world so have I sent them into the world and for their sake I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth I chose this text as the foundation for our study on this idea of sanctification because in those a couple verses three verses 17, 18, and 19 of John is the nucleus of the doctrine of sanctification from those three verses you can fan out and find centered there the foundation for sanctification now before we progress any further I want to follow the advice of a dear friend of mine who said it isn't enough just to use the same terms. You've got to use the same dictionary. So I want to make sure we understand what we mean and what the scriptures mean when it talks about sanctification or sanctify. 
The term usually in the King James and other versions, sanctify or sanctification, means holy. Holiness. It can also mean consecration or to set aside, to set apart. So when Jesus prayed in John 17, sanctify them, he is praying that God would make them holy, that they would become holy, set apart, righteous, make them clean. And he's not talking about taking a shower, <laughs> washing the, the dirt and grime of life and Away. He's talking about a morality, a spiritualness, to make them clean spiritually. And that has the same meaning whether we're looking in the Old Testament or whether we're looking in the New Testament. That means to consecrate, to set apart, to make holy, to make clean. Now secondly, I think we should make sure we understand who Jesus is talking about here because in our verses it's the pronoun sanctify them who's the them who is he talking about here well if you go back to verse number 9 you will see he's talking about initially his disciples those whom the father has given to him he said I pray for them not for the world but I pray for those whom you have given to me. Thine they are. And I have them, I have taught them, I have revealed to them everything you have given to me to say to them and to teach them. Thine they are. So he's talking about his disciples. When we look at the verse immediately after our text in verse 20 you will see that Jesus includes you and me <laughs> for he says I, I don't only pray for those that you have given to me but I also pray for those who will believe because of their word that's us so the Lord Jesus remembered in his prayer not just those his disciples those immediate followers of his but he remembered those like us and down through the centuries and those of multitudes of nations now who have come to faith in Christ because of their testimony because of their word I want us to see further that there is a hint in this text that tells us that sanctification and holiness is part of God's mission for his creation. I want us to go back and see where it starts and to see its place in God's mission and his plan of redemption. It isn't something new. It started in the garden in Eden. For you will recall when God created man, male and female, he created them upright. That's not a description of them standing on two feet, although they did. It's a description of their spiritual condition. He created them upright in His image. He created them holy, righteous, without sin. And before they sinned, He gave them a series of commands. We so often concentrate just on the one command of don't eat the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. But in actuality, God gave them eight commands. Now, there were three commands that he gave before they sinned. 
In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, I believe is the reference. He says, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's a command telling Adam and Eve to have children, have family, and to spread throughout all of the earth the conditions present at the time, which were holiness and righteousness. So that God's design for Adam and Eve and their offspring would cause them to be fruitful, multiply, and to fill the earth with God's presence. Through their righteous, holy lives. So that the temple, which the Garden of Eden was, God's presence on earth, would actually spread throughout all of the earth so that all of the earth would become His temple, His residence, His place of being, holy and righteous. Then, as God gave to Adam direction on his responsibilities within the garden in Eden, not just to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and to fill the earth with God's presence, he also warned them and said to them, guard and protect the garden. They were to protect the holiness and the righteousness of the garden and of God's presence with them and in their lives, protected from outside interference and intrusion, which would interfere with that condition. As we all know, Adam and Eve failed not only to obey the command to not eat the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, but they did not replenish the earth. They did not guard the garden and all of the other commands that God gave them. Maybe they violated them. They disobeyed them. God in His grace and in His mercy did not set aside His plan and say, well, that was a good idea to start with. Let's go to plan B. (laughs) What do we do now? No. He began to set in motion his plan to bring about his original design, which was to spread his presence throughout all the earth with holiness and righteousness. And so he made a promise to Adam and Eve. Genesis 3.15, I believe, is the reference. He cursed the serpent and he punished Adam and Eve for their sin and then he made a promise. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. The very first instance we have recorded of God beginning to reveal how he would bring about his plan only now it becomes a plan of redemption that would eventuate into and culminate in the fulfillment of his original plan the spreading of his presence in holiness and righteousness throughout all of the earth We come to Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, the call of Abraham. God now beginning to reveal even further how he would bring about the fulfillment of his plan and purpose. He called Abraham, the idol worshiper, out of Ur of the Chaldees and said, I will make of you a great nation, and through your seed 
all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. The seed, of course, Christ. Then we come to Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 19. God has brought them out of Egypt, which he told them he would do after 400 years of slavery and captivity down in Egypt. He said, I will bring you out with a strong hand. And he brought them to Mount Sinai and he met with them there and he said, you are my chosen people. You are above all of the nations of the earth. Be holy. He called them to holiness. And through you, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. (coughs) And then in Exodus chapter 20, we have the outline of the Ten Commandments that God gave to them a description of holy, righteous living. Live this way. Obey my commands. You will be a blessing to all of the nations of the earth. And you can even read in Deuteronomy chapter 4, I believe it is, where Moses reminds them of this fact. And says, if you will obey God and walk after Him in holiness, all of the nations of the earth will look upon you with wonder. And they will say to themselves, what a marvelous God these people worship. God calling them to holiness and to righteous living. Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, we have... the ups and downs of the children of Israel walking in holiness walking in sin walking in holiness walking in sin God had designed for them the pattern of the temple which they built a place of residence for God and associated with the temple and with the sacrifices that he provided for them for their sin to make them holy, to sanctify them repeatedly the direction is given sanctify yourself sanctify yourself when you make the offerings and the sacrifices sanctify yourself and the priests were to especially sanctify themselves for their duties and their responsibilities within the temple and with the offerings. And it describes how the children of Israel were to prepare themselves to meet God. Sanctify yourself today and tomorrow and the next day because on the fourth day you're going to meet God. Sanctify yourself, therefore. Make yourself clean because you're going to meet God. It also was used to describe their relationship with God. It was to be a holy, righteous relationship with God. Again, we all know how they failed. They could not do it. Not only could they not do it, they didn't want to do it. As further revelation of God's plan as to how he would bring about his design to extend his presence and holiness throughout all the earth, he made some new promises to them. And we read in Jeremiah chapter 31. He said, I will make a new covenant with you. Not like the old covenant. I want us to read these verses because it gives us some foundation that we will cover in a couple lessons in the future as we further examine this 
aspect of sanctification and holiness. Jeremiah 31, 31. It says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Then turn over to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. By the way, if you want an interesting Bible study, go through the scriptures and find the number of instances where God acted for the purpose of his name only. Not because they had repented, not because they had turned to the Lord, but God actually brought to them repentance and turned them for the sake of his name. It's an interesting study. Here's an example of it. He said, I'm going to do this for my own name's sake. For my own name's sake, I'm going to come and I'm going to do something because you have profaned my name. You have ruined my name. I'm going to come and clean it up. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give, give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules." From those two passages, we see a further revelation of God's plan, which he had in the very beginning at creation, how he's going to begin to bring it to pass. I'm going to make a new covenant. This new covenant, I will take care of it. I will put my law upon your heart. I will put it within you. You will know me. I will give to you my spirit and I will give to you a new heart not like your present heart which is a heart of stone and I'll just mention in parentheses here oftentimes we in the Christian world talk about reforming our heart no your heart isn't reformed you have a new heart You have a new heart. God gives you a new heart. And that new heart, he says, I will cause you to walk in my law. Now we're going to look at this in a future study in more detail as to how this comes about and how God brings it to pass. But here's the introduction of it here in the Old Testament. 
by the prophets saying, God hasn't forgotten his plan. He hasn't put it on the shelf. He's slowly revealing it to us. Here's a further revelation of it. He says he's going to make a new covenant. He's going to put his law within our hearts. He will give to us his spirit and a new heart and he will cause us to walk after that law that he has put in our hearts. That was all unfulfilled throughout the Old Testament. That was a promise and a prophecy unfulfilled through all the rest of the Old Testament. Until we read in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, God, in the fullness of time, brought forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem them who are under the law. God's design was for all of it to be fulfilled in Christ. The culmination of it in Christ. The new creation. God hinting at it in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel. Hinting at the fact that it would take a new creature to walk in holiness. It would take a creature in whom God dwelled to fulfill his design and purpose. A humanity filled with God's Spirit enabled to fulfill his command and his plan and purpose. Old Testament. Stated and declared by the prophets. Describing God's plan and purpose as to how he would bring it to pass. They didn't see it. We do. We live in the era of the rule and reign of Christ. We live in the time when we can look to its fulfillment and see it completed in Christ. And thereby we can then experience the fullness of God's plan and purpose for us as individuals. An interesting little study I did When Jesus talked about his disciples and he prayed for them, you find repeated throughout the New Testament this phrase, saints. When Paul wrote his letters, it was always to the saints at. That's repeated in all of his books. I don't want to say categorically but I think probably every one of his books well maybe Timothy and Titus and Philemon he may not have but when he sent them to the churches always to the saints at Thessalonica to the saints at Corinth to the saints at Galatia that's plural giving to us the indication that God's design and plan and purpose is for individuals but it's also for the assembly the church the congregation of the righteous and God's design and plan and purpose isn't just for you and for me as individuals it is but it is also for the church God's plan and purpose is for His temple presence to fill the earth. 
the church has become the new temple. We as individual believers are also temples. That temple presence is to fill the earth so that we as individuals and the congregations of the righteous ones will fill the earth with God's presence, with His righteousness, with His holiness. Inherent in examining the doctrine of sanctification, you must also understand the depravity of man. We do not like to view ourselves as depraved men. And without Christ, that's what we are. Hopeless, helpless, godless. One writer I read describes it this way, we are God-haters. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I, I love God. No, no, we don't. Without Christ, we do not. We do not seek Him. We do not truly desire Him. We do not submit ourselves to Him. And all too often, once we come to saving faith in Christ, that pattern still holds. We like to have our heaven with a little bit of hell thrown in. We really are kind of like that picture on my wall. It is the few who would say, excuse me, excuse me. I'm going to go against the grain. I'm going to go against the crowd. And I'm going to pursue after God and walk in a righteous, holy fashion. That's not God's design. God's design and plan is not an option. Holiness, righteousness, sanctification is not a designation of a special few. And I can take it or leave it. It is God's design and plan and purpose for His people. And if you count yourself as one of God's people and you claim that you have trusted Christ in saving faith, God's plan and purpose for you is to live a righteous, holy life. That's not an option. That's part of the package. Now, what can we conclude from these truths? Because God's mission and His plan of redemption commands and demands that His people walk and live in holiness with the purpose to spread it throughout all the earth, we as children of God must pursue after holiness and righteousness in our individual lives and in our church. What are the implications of those truths then? We must recognize that it is God's plan. That's His plan and purpose. Hopefully in the, in the brief recounting of tracing it through the Old Testament to its culmination in Christ, and we will examine that in more detail in, in our next study, but hopefully you have seen how God has designed that for His creation. Therefore, it is not an option but an obligation. 
that we pursue after holiness. That we integrate holiness into our daily lives and our practice and our plans and our purposes and our thoughts. Those are the implications of the truth. I pray that you will. I pray that you will seek after him.